Hey guys, this is Stu from 180 Nutrition and I am delighted to welcome Martin Silva back to the podcast. Martin, mate, how are you? I'm really, really good, thanks my man. How are you? Yeah, very good, very good. It's been too long, so we're really, really keen to tap into some of your wisdom today. But first up, for any of our listeners that may not be familiar with you or your work, haven't listened to any, any of I think we've done two or three previous episodes which have been packed full of the most uh, amazing information on body transformation, health and wellness, all of that all of that stuff. I'd love it if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Sure, yeah. Thanks again for having me on, Stu. Really, really appreciate it. Like I just said off air then, I'm sure I've been on this podcast more than Stu. You know, <laughs> like my fifth, fifth time or something. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, a little bit more about myself. As some of the audience might know, I'm huge. You know, health and fitness is my life, essentially. So I live, breathe and eat a healthy lifestyle and you know I've built a career out of that as well and I've been within the fitness industry for you know 15 16 years now which sounds crazy because I still feel like I'm in my early 20s but I'm actually coming up to 36 now and yeah I was a qualified personal trainer from the age of 20 and you know always played sports from a young age and I've always been you know just so passionate about fitness and now it's got to the point where it's I always say to people is something might start off as your passion but then it becomes your purpose. Mm. Now it's literally, it's my purpose. And I get what I'm doing now, obviously, with the transformation program and everything else, because I was a personal trainer face-to-face for about 13 years. And then I built like an online transformation program, actually just before COVID happened, about three years ago. And I'm having a much bigger impact this way as well, you know, because as we've talked about before, and we'll talk about today, you know, really helping people change their mindset, mm. you know, really upgrade the way they think and, just basically think at a better level and change the relationship with food and alcohol, which we all know the stuff outside of the gym. A lot of my clients love the gym part. You know what I mean? That's the fun part. But then the stuff outside of the gym, you know, some of them have had more struggles than others yeah. in terms of behavior change and everything else. But yeah, a bit more about myself, really. I, uh, I moved over the shoe, just like moved over the shoe, moved over to Oz, uh, just like Stu did uh, quite a few years ago. Um, I haven't been here as long as Stu, but I've been here for six years now. So moved over to Oz, came over here over here for a, for a year from Wales in the UK and you know fast forward six years I'm still here permanent resident now and living in Sydney living the dream and Stu's, Stu's living even more of the dream up there in Byron Bay you know what I mean so we can't complain mate <laughs> come, come up and see me come up and see me now I will I will um just preference you will frame this for our for our listeners as well and I've said I've said this before um on one of our last recordings but for all of those that are um, <clears throat> in front of the computer right now or listening on the phone, just Google Martin Silver Fitness. Now have a look at what, who you are, what you've done, how, what, how you look, what you do to achieve your look. Um, so very much sports, fitness, healthy lifestyle, but you have taken most people's I- ideal dream of and you've made it your reality for a very long time, uh, and irrespective of whether you're travelling or you, you've got a huge, you know, heavy load, you stick to your principles and stick to your guns, um, and you get the results that you want, and you get the results for your your clients as well. So, kudos to Thanks, you mate. for being out. I wanted to say it. as well, randomly earlier, I remembered actually, because I remember you said on one or two episodes before, just type in Martin Silva now. Yeah, and your voice popped into my head. It That's was like, it. Just type in. I don't know why earlier on, so I typed it in oh. on Google. So well, apologies for the listeners. There's going to be some raunchy photos there, man. Well, no. <laughs> a couple of them. I was like, for the bodybuilding days, I was like, oh, oh okay. On, All right, on, on, on your, on your head there. Hopefully, my laying on the line won't see that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Exactly right. Nah, it's not. I was, I was doing a conversation with my uh, friend the podcast. And he was like, you should start an OnlyFans, mate, joking around, you know yeah. what I'm saying? I'm like, bloody hell. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you absolutely kill it. Nah, you, you know, you, you, <laughs> you, you, you walk the walk, talk the talk, whatever the saying is. But I mean, you, uh, you have what people want. And hopefully, this conversation will help them realign some of their values and, 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 and just areas of their life that just need a little bit of adjustment. And I thought that We'd probably just jump into nutrition, which is just the biggest topic. It's a religion in its own in, in its own mind. But in ter- in, instead of um, kind of listing out, you know, what your philosophy is on eating, etc., because our listeners can go back in time and listen where we've covered that extensively. I'm kind of intrigued to hear as to how you're currently eating right now and why. Um, 
But what you've tried in the past and then dismissed, and it might be, you know what, I wanted to nourish my gut, so I ate a truckload of fruits and vegetables and probiotic fiber and all this kind of stuff didn't work and kind of changed it because um, like science, like we constantly evolve and we're tweaking and we're finding new things and our body changes as well. So what, what are you doing from a nutritional standpoint right now? Yeah, so... Thanks to Stu, really. I mean, I switched over to eating more of an animal-based diet a couple of years ago. We actually jumped, I think it was the last podcast we'd done. Mm. And I was, so I'll go back, but I want to just touch on this first, you know, because over the last two years, I've definitely been eating an animal-based diet and I've gone more, more and more carnival, if you like. However, we can always label things, right? We can label it keto, mm. carnival, paleo. And to answer your question, I've tried every single one. So I think this is a fantastic question because I've been – here, there, and everywhere when it comes to different approaches with nutrition, behaviors with food, binge eating, go down the list, right? Because obviously with bodybuilding that I used to do back in the day, I went through some struggles there in terms of relationship with food and everything else. But in terms of what I've dismissed, one of them is definitely the plant-based one. Yeah. <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to hold my hands up. No, I'm, and, you know, obviously the thing with nutrition and diet is there's so much individual variance from person to person. So someone listening back to this might be you might be thriving on a plant-based diet. And that's the the complex but almost amazing thing about nutrition and behaviors in the human body is everyone is so different, especially with nutrition. So I did I started off, let's just go back a bit. So when I really started getting more aware, because to be honest, I was a trainer for probably around about 10 years before I even kind of started to crack the code, so to speak. Not 10 years, sorry, it's more like five or six years before I really started honing in on nutrition in terms of eating more whole foods, being more aware of these things, because I was in great shape in my early 20s anyway. It was in fantastic. Yeah. Even since I was 18 years old, I was in fantastic shape because I started lifting at a young age, genetics and everything else. And it was only when I really started paying attention to, oh, actually, you know, I don't feel too good when I eat crap food. Mm. I think I must have got to, got to about 23, 24 until I started connecting the dots with that. Um, and then I naturally just started eating more kind of meat and cooking my own meals, and just, just naturally just being more aware. And I was about 24, 25 then. And actually I started getting to a good place because I was eating just more whole foods like we always talk about. I guess when I look back, I was nowhere near – I didn't have the knowledge to be honest back then. When I look back, I was actually eating – single ingredient foods primarily you know i started yeah. off doing that and it was like oh, okay eating more salmon meat veggies etc started feeling better started performing better as a byproduct started looking better and then i discovered bodybuilding right so cut a long story short i got into bodybuilding then got to the high level with that you know got to the pro level competed competed nine times in total obviously i don't don't compete anymore and then that went from really get into a good place, my relationship with food, naturally wanted to eat more whole foods, to get into a point where it was like, right, extreme measures, didn't know what I was doing, just jumped on stage on a whim, had like an old school bodybuilder, give me a diet plan, you know, which was treacherous, very restrictive, the same story really, you know, chicken and broccoli, everyone's heard the bodybuilding, typical mm -hmm. cliche bodybuilding stories in terms of, you know, eating eight meals a day and eating turkey and asparagus, I'm not exaggerating either, literally eight meals a day at one point and turkey oh, and asparagus God. every single meal. And I ended up, no oh, shit. Uh, excuse the French, sorry. Um, no, no wonder. I actually ended up getting you know a poor relationship with food and being overly restricted when I was getting on stage was leading to overeating when I got off the stage. It's what I like to call a symptom eruption, and you can relate this just to anyone listening back. It's not just bodybuilding. You know, when you try and restrict, you might be trying to drop weight, trying to drop weight, trying to lose fat, and then what you're doing is you start restricting foods and you know restricting calories, and then you can become overly restrictive. And what happens then is you'll get a symptom eruption, right? You get to the weekend, you try to suppress all those symptoms in terms of emotional eating and essentially just restricting the food you enjoy and then you end up just overeating and binging. Well, yeah. that's what I was doing after each comp and then because of the impact, it's different when it comes to bodybuilding it's just not healthy for the body. Mm. So, you know, you end up having a negative impact on your hormones and everything else. So, whatever was going on, some of it was physiological, a lot of it was psychological. I ended up then having a struggle with food. So, even when I wasn't competing, I would be just overeating on the weekends and, and trapped in that cycle of essentially restricting in the week. Because another thing was, without going off too much, is I got really attached to how I looked. And I'm sure the audience can resonate with this. I got so attached with how I looked physically. I don't think a lot of guys talk about this, but when you do bodybuilding, naturally you're getting critiqued against other mm. athletes on stage. So you start then looking at like, what body parts do I need to improve on? You've been absolutely shredded. Again, I'm sure people can identify with this when you've got really lean. My clients say this to me as well. I want to get back to where I was. 
And it's like, we're going to get, we're going to reinvent yourself now. Yes, you're going to get back to how you're feeling, but we're going to get you to the next level. But you're always going back and looking back at how you looked and everything else. So then I was constantly trying to, in that mind, almost in that diet mindset. And even when I wasn't competing, because in the week I'd be eating the foods that I ate pretty much for bodybuilding, similar, you know, chicken, potato, asparagus, the usual stuff, very restrictive. And then I would get to a Friday, I would have that, that symptom eruption that I talked about. Um, but then after that, then I, I had to, I had to fix it really. Right. So again, cut a long story short, I then started getting lots of gut issues and, you know, mentally obviously wasn't feeling the best when I was doing that every weekend. So I had to really change. And it, for me, it was, it was that pain that was driving change. Yeah. And I talked to my clients about this as well. And this is what's enabled me to be an even better coach. I've got the wisdom. I've got the 15 years of experience and thousands of hours or whatever it is. But it's more a case of the experience that I've well, Not more a case of because, it, it, you know, there's loads of different levels to this, right? But the being through down to the trenches with this stuff enables me to have more compassion for my clients and actually be able to help them better. So, you know, I got to that point then where it was just so much pain. And when you're in enough pain, you can either go two ways. You can keep going down that slippery slope, which, by the way, I know a lot of bodybuilders which did. I know a lot of bodybuilders now, back when I was doing this 10 years ago, in the same position, doing the same thing they were doing, you know? Yeah. Poor relationship with food, taking selfies, you know what I mean? Spray tan. That used to be me, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I evolved, luckily, and I got to the point where it was just it was just a nightmare, so I thought, right, I need to start fixing this again. So now it was more of a conscious thing, right? This is not working. I'm, you know, I'm eating 5,000 calories in Domino's Pizza and Ben and Jerry's, you know, tw- twice a week on the, tw- twice on, twice on the weekends. Wow. Then I'm restricted. Then I'm punishing myself in the gym. Um, so yeah, so then I started just um, honing in on just fixing my gut. So I was getting gut issues and everything else. Um, and then I kind of took more of a um, more of a paleo approach. Then so I started removing. Rather than having that mindset of removing things, I know I've talked about this extensively before, but I always had this approach with clients as well, and I think I really want to reinforce this point. I wasn't thinking about what I needed to cut out. All I was thinking about is, right, what do I need to add in? How can I fix this problem? Mm. Right, I need to improve my gut. Let's add in more vegetables. Let's add in more protein to blunt my appetite more. Okay, let's not be too restricted. Let's, let's have more complete meals, yeah? Let's stop, stop eating chicken breasts and potato because you're not really getting the fats that you need and the micronutrients that you need. So let's add in more vegetables. Let's have a more variety, you know, maybe switch up the meat sources and everything else. And then I started just enjoying my meals more. And uh, it was more of a paleo approach though. When I look back, it was more kind of like just literally uh, meat, some vegetables, and that was pretty much it, and some fruit as well. Um, that was kind of the approach I took. So I've tried paleo. I've tried all these different kind of approaches, um, but it always came back. And even keto, I've you know dipped in with that. And we can talk about fasting and stuff now, which is something I don't really even look at as fasting anymore. I think um, I think that's an important thing as well for people to understand when I'm talking about restriction. It's the word you use mentally when you mm. say fasting. Again, you, you, you're taken away. You're restricted. That's so right. when you even use that word, people, most people struggle with calorie restriction they struggle to lose weight so when you start adding in oh fasting it's taken away again it's restricting again it's going down that same slippery slope so for me it's just for the last six seven years i've been eating later in the day because i feel better i don't even look at it people say oh you fast do you and i'm like oh yeah actually i do i just tend to feel better and be more productive when i have one or two big meals a day which is what we'll talk about um so to be honest you i've tried lots of different approaches really but it wasn't really a necessarily a conscious thing in terms of you know keto paleo when i look back i was definitely taking more of a paleo approach when i when i fixed this problem um and just removing i just started having less dairy and i noticed i felt better i didn't get the gut issues that i had and you know just less processed foods in general yeah. yeah um but yeah but where i'm at now i do eat more of an animal-based diet i eat meats and fruit primarily and i'm thriving right now really that was a that was a very long-winded breakdown but uh, no, it's, it's, it's a long story to you it, it, it's, it's good to hear and i think it's important to note as well that oftentimes society tells us, well, you're going to have to eat more fruits and vegetables to be healthy. Um, but of course, we're all at very different stages in our health journey. And you mentioned that you had some gut issues. I've had some gut issues as well. And I would say that 95% of the population probably could agree that they've had gut issues at some stage um, in their lives as well. And for me, and for many people that I've spoken to, Increasing the amount of fiber or when your gut is compromised doesn't generally help uh, and oftentimes can make things worse. And so trying to concentrate and fix whatever's going on inside and shifting to that more animal-based approach, um, irrespective of, of what you want to call it, 
kind of is restrictive in, in as much as you're just cutting out a lot of the stuff that would potentially cause uh, issues with a compromised gut. And so I know um, I mentioned previously that collagen was great for me. Uh, it, just, it just seemed to help the gut um, tremendous, tremendously. And, and just pulling back a little bit on, on a lot of these vegetables that used to make me feel bloated. And, and now I'm kind of pushing, pushing them back in um, just to try and hit all of those micro and macronutrients as well without any issue. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, I think, on that. Definitely animal-based. For me, um, protein, fat, um, and and um, micronutrients are really, really important. Nutrient density for me is the key. I just want to make sure that I'm getting all of the building blocks as I age, which which kind of leads me on to then. You'll you'll have some. You'll be the expert in the room on protein intake, coming from where you have, and being able to do what you've done with all of the protein that you were ingesting. Now. The more I've been listening and reading and researching, like protein, super, super, super important as we age, um, and kind of irrespective of where you are in in life, um, it's not something that we want to scrimp on. (coughs) But a lot of people are confused. How much do I need? Like, what type of protein do I take? Like, when when should I take it? So, what are your thoughts on on that? So with protein, it's funny you say that because I do notice time and time again patterns with any clients that I've taken on in the past. Thankfully now, I'm very selective with who I take on and I need to make sure the person's a good fit so everyone gets results. But in the past, the patterns I've seen is whenever people are under eating, it depends on how much the person weighs in terms of how much they need. But rather than going into the grams and stuff like that, let's talk about the behavioral thing and also why it's so critical that you actually have adequate protein. When you're under eating protein, naturally what you do is you replace those calories with more fats and carbs, essentially, Mm -hmm. right? So you're always going to be, when you're hungry, you need to eat, right? As simple as that. And when you're not adding, when you're not being mindful of having a certain amount of protein each meal, this is a simple thing that I I get clients to implement. And I'm really, it it doesn't matter, you know, there's lots of research to show you need to eat, eat a certain amount of protein each meal, to build muscle, for example, right, and for the, the anabolic window and all that kind of stuff, and you know, meal time and eating frequently is key because it keeps your metabolism elevated. And none of that is um, is actually true, basically, mm. right? And this has been proven now in research, right? So the key thing is, are you eating enough protein day to day, right? And if you had a day or two under where you're not having adequate protein, it's not really going to be a big issue. But adding more whole foods and single ingredient foods, right? So that it's always going to come back to this as well, even when it comes to protein. It's like, right, how can I adds how can I get basically the best of both worlds? Just like Stu was saying there, micronutrients, right? So are you having complete meals? I always say to my clients, you know, especially when they feel like, oh, what, what can I have to snack, right? I get this question. Yeah. I don't really get it as much now because, again, a lot of people I take on, they're already at a, a, a quite a good level, but a lot of them still do struggle with, you know, snacking and overeating and stuff like that. And it's like, well, most of the time when you're snacking, you're just not having complete meals. And it's a behavioral thing as well. It's an emotional thing and you're eating based on emotions or mistaken hunger for thirst, which is also a big one as well, just simply not drinking enough water mm. or having enough salt. When we strip it all back, you know, the person is just basically um, not eating not eating enough protein either, right? So mm-hmm. really the, the key thing is having adequate protein each meal, right? So I always get my clients to try and have, you know, say one to two palm-sized amounts basically of meat with each meal. And when you're having meat, when you have a red meat specifically, for example, or ruminant, Meat from ruminant mammals, right? Whether that be, you know, uh, cow, elk, deer, those kind of things, right? Bison, those kind of things. But, you know, beef is going to be the most nutrient dense food you can eat anyway. So when you're having more complete, you know, you're having fats and protein together in one, right? With those kind of foods. And then you're having, you know, if you can, again, we were talking about gut health and stuff like that. If you if you don't have any issues with vegetables and plant, plant-based foods, especially vegetables, you know, including that on your plate as well, as you know, having the fiber and micronutrients from vegetables, having the micronutrients and protein, so a good balance of protein and fats as well on your plate. So having, you know, and I say to my clients as well, having beef or having, sometimes having chicken thighs instead of breast. So you're getting more fat from the meat then, mm. which then tend to keep you more satiated as well. So having that balance of protein and fats, but just... Cut long story short, really, you want to be trying to aim to have protein with every single meal. And if you can get that through single ingredient foods, really, um, especially, you know, like just simply beef, chicken, fish, eggs, single ingredient foods, especially eggs and beef, which are going to give you, you know, beef alone gives you pretty much all the essential nutrients you need. 
Not to say that I would recommend that, right, in terms of thriving by just eating beef, but you're going to get most of the balance of protein, fats, and micronutrients you need just from eating beef, essentially, right? So beef and eggs, like an egg yolk is like a perfect multivitamin. So if you include those kind of foods into your, into your um, food regime every single day, it's kind of hard to go wrong, but aiming for those single ingredient foods to get your protein intake is always going to be the best bet. And then if you're really struggling with that, obviously having a supplement then. So I do get a lot of my clients to you know, have a protein supplement to make up for the protein they haven't got and yeah. make sure they have an adequate protein. Um, but yeah, I would definitely just say trying to focus on never having any meals where you're not having at least 30 to 40 grams of protein. So that's like a palm to two palm sized amounts of meat. Yeah. Um, and if, you, if you're having, you know, let's say you have a smoothie in the mornings, simply add a, add a serving or two of good quality protein to that as well. And just getting into the habit of doing that because then what happens mm-hmm. is, you know, it blunts your appetite. And not to mention as well, when it comes to, if we talk about fat loss, for example, there's research to show now, you know, they split two groups up. They have one group having, they have the same calories, both groups. One group had really high protein. The other group had like moderate to low protein. And the high protein group actually lost more fat over even, it was only like an eight week period. And they lost a significant amount more of body fat and weight just from having more protein because of the thermic effect from protein and fiber as well, but fiber nowhere near as much in terms of the thermic effect. So, you know, 10% of your daily calories essentially uh, are going to come from the, the output is going to come from the thermic effect of food. So it's really important, I would say, for anyone, you know, in kilos to, to aim for at a bare minimum, I would say like 1.8 grams of protein per kilo of your body weight. We could just round it off to two to make it easy. Yeah. So if you weigh, you know, if, you, if you're a woman who weighs 60 kilos, you want to be aiming for around about 120 I would say, you know, if we take that down to about even 1.5, 1.5 grams of protein is a bare minimum per kilo of your weight. Um, that is going to be, because even if you say for someone now, for a woman, the average person, right, you weigh 60 kilos, if I ask you to eat 120 grams of protein, for the most part, that's going to be a major struggle, mm. which is why, like a lot of my clients I take on, they're, they're grossly under eating protein. Um, and that's been one of the main contributors, if not like one of the top, the number one contributor to them not actually getting results, obviously, you know, gym as well, but not getting results and not losing fat and gaining weight because they're over eating calories, but also the metabolism is not, it's like you want to get your body to, to automatically burn as many calories as you can by itself. Mm. That's the key thing here, right? So eating protein is going to, number one, blunt your appetite. So it's going to, essentially, you're going to have a way uh, lower chance of overeating. And also it's going to really speed up that metabolic rate. And for me, mm. I just noticed that I have, you know, like 300 grams of protein a day, sometimes even more. And it's just impossible for me to overeat because I eat pretty much all in sing- single ingredient foods. Mm. You know, if I'm eating fruit, it's avocado, it's berries, it's banana. Yeah. You know, it's single ingredient foods. And that simple thing there, it sounds very simple, it's not easy though. If you can eat just single ingredient foods and you can have, say, two grams of protein per kilo of your body weight, uh, which is going to be challenging for most people, but I always say to start slow as well. So there's so much value to you in just tracking. For anyone listening, it's just a track for one mm. week. Uh, just protein. Then you have to track all your calories. You know, use my fitness pal and just track the meat and the protein that you're having and see how much you're having. If you're having 60 grams, then try and add, you know, try and have one meal where, or try and have more protein for breakfast because that's a big problem I see with people is they don't have enough protein for breakfast. So again, something that Stu mentioned before in one of his blogs is simply having what you would have for dinner for breakfast. That's I get right. my clients to sometimes have some leftover meat from the night before, some beef mints with their eggs and their avocado in the morning, you know? And it's an absolute game changer then. So then they hit the protein target because they're already having a decent amount for lunch and dinner anyway. And it's job done. Uh, but it does come down to really implementing those habits and being so. consistent. And you just notice your energy levels flies up as well, well you know, when you right. have more protein. And, and if breakfast looks like a conventional breakfast, then I think you're in trouble. Like, if, yeah. you know, if, if you're toast and juice or coffee and toast or bagel or whatever it might be, bowl of cereal, you're in, you're in trouble. And one thing that I've noticed... Um, as well, and it's a good talking point that you mentioned snacking before. Like, you know, what shall I have for a snack? Well, the first question might be, well, why do you need to snack? Like, well, I, if you have a good breakfast, like I'll have my breakfast about seven o'clock in the morning, big breakfast, like big breakfast. But then I'll eat lunch at two. There's no need to snack, like no need to snack. And I'll have my evening meal mm. maybe five thirty. Uh, again, no need to snack because I'm concentrating mm. on my protein. I've got my mix, I've got my fats in there, I've got slow-burning carbohydrates, there's some fiber in there, so you've got the whole package. It's all whole food-based, um, plenty of protein, hit, hit all of my targets, and I'm not really one to track food, but I do keep an eye on protein. Like I go for that two grams per kilo body weight. I'm just over 70 kilos, so I kind of try and get make sure that I get at least 50 grams of protein in every single meal. 
Um, it's yeah. a, it's often more because I like to I like to um, I like to mix in the occasional um, collagen as well uh, directly after a meal. But mm. it, in in terms of people that you mentioned that you eat later on in the day, and yes, that could be considered fasting. Pro- pro- probably sixteen eight. How easy will it be for people to consume the the appropriate amount of calories, hit their macros for protein? If they're into fasting, they don't have that much of an appetite, um, but they want to improve their body composition, they want to improve their energy levels, they want to improve all of the other areas in their health, uh, in their life, like things like sleep, uh, cognition, um, overall feeling of happiness. How can you do yeah. that, do you think, if you're infatuated on, you know, fasting is going to take me there, when it's more than likely going to take you into maybe a protein deficit for the day. Mm, it comes down to the why again, doesn't it? Like mm. you said then about emotional eating. Mm. And I'm actually going to I do a coaching call on a Tuesday night and I'm going to chat to my clients about this. And it's, it's a, I'm always reinforcing the same things really, but just coming from a different angle. And it's like most people really don't know what true hunger is mm. to start with. So that was actually a really valuable thing that I learned. Obviously, I learned this from competing as well, from, from essentially being starved. But fasting as well really taught me what true hunger was because I used to eat because I thought I had to eat. I would eat every couple of hours or whatever. It was just a habit. It just becomes a habit eating, and you become less less aware of why you're eating. Um, but with fasting, to hit – I would just say – I would just answer it this way. From all the people that I've coached and everything else, like most people – I can count on one hand – the amount of people right now that I have in implementing fasting, you know, it's, it's way later down the line. It's a tool you can use in your toolbox. If anyone listening back has wanted to try, cause I know there's a lot of research on this, right? So I understand totally why people want to do it. There's lots of research to see the benefits and we could talk about that forever. But you've got to ask yourself, like, are you trying to do it purely for health from a health standpoint? Because mm. if you're trying to do it cause it's convenient, you know, cause for me it's convenient. And then I just happen to get all the other benefits and I'll tell you how I do it now. Um, but if you're, Most people really need to focus on that food quality first and focus on really being aware of how much protein you're having on a daily basis because I I wouldn't say everyone needs to track, but for most people listening back to this, like there's so much value in just tracking to see how much protein you eat on a daily basis because a lot of people on the weekends as well, you know, I have people say, yeah, I eat plenty of protein. And then when we shine a light on what they're doing on the weekend, they're grossly under eating on the weekend. So going back to fasting though, it's challenging. Like for me, I'm... An anomaly, I guess, because I can eat one meal. Like today, I have one meal. So I'll probably about three, four times a week, I'll have just one meal in a day because I find I can just get more done in the mornings. And then, you know, I enjoy having a big meal, but I'll have one or two big meals a day. And for me, it's no problem. I really enjoy eating meat. I don't get any digestion issues. So I can eat what most people eat in, you know, two to three days in one meal, you know, but most people are not going to be able to do that. So what I would say, I would focus first and foremost, before you even look at fasting, I would focus on, are you consistently hitting protein? It depends on what your goal is as well, right? If you want to improve the way your body looks and you want to just be healthier and more energetic and you want to uh, really improve improve metabolic health and those kind of things, right? You know, eating adequate protein is going to be key. So focus on that first. And if you're struggling to get, you know, your target just through your normal eating habits, then obviously throwing in fasting is just going to basically throw a spanner in the work because that means then you've got to try and get, you know, even a bigger an even bigger amount into, say, one or two meals. But I do have clients doing it. And the the, the answer to this really is just simply eating, you know, more meats uh, mm. with each meal. And if you can do that and you don't get any, any digestion issues, if you're thinking of just eating, say, two meals a day, as long as you're hitting that target we talked about, just to give a generic number, say two grams of protein per kilo of body weight, and you can do that in two meals, then fantastic. But the average person is not going to be able to have even 60 grams of protein uh, each meal consistently. They're just not going to be able to do it. Yeah. So I would definitely focus on the order of priorities and go, right, what's the quality of food like I'm, eat, uh, I'm eating? You know, am I actually getting results if you want to you know, improve the way your body looks and stuff? Are you actually getting leaner? Are you seeing your body respond? Because if you're not, then obviously something's going wrong there. And for the most part, if you struggle to lose fat, obviously you're overeating calories. And if you're overeating calories, you're definitely eating too much ultra-processed food, 100%. Even if you don't think you are, a lot of people say, you know, I eat healthy, and they're just not educated enough in terms of what whole foods are. Mm. Because everything's marketed nowadays. You know, protein is like a magical, I've said this before, it's like a magical macronutrient now, right? You see protein on all the wrappers. Um, So the reality is you want to be focusing on eating single ingredient foods, whole foods at least 80, 90% of the time first, then hitting that protein target. And then if you're fasting and you're doing both those things, 
as long as you're getting a big amount of protein onto your two or three meals and you're being really diligent with that, then you're not going to have any issues. But going back to what I said, even with protein, I would really focus because everyone, when they, when they hear the word protein, and a lot of people, when they, they, most people don't know what high protein is either. That's another thing because people say, yeah, you know, I've had, I've taken on clients before. Yeah, I eat quite high protein. And you look and they've had like, you know, a piece of cheese, a few nuts, and maybe a protein shake. And you're like, yeah, you're grossly under eating protein. You know, <laughs> so a lot of people don't know what high protein is. No. So if you try doing that, if you try eating 60 grams of protein, like 60 grams of protein in one meal, for example, what does that look like? That looks like around about 300 grams, maybe 350 grams even of like steak, for example, right? Yeah. Um, each meal or 350 grams of chicken one meal 350 grams maybe even 400 grams of beef on the other meal right most some people can do that but a lot of people are not going to do that consistently day in day out um, so you've got to be mindful of those days where you're likely to grossly under eat protein which a lot of times on the weekends when people are socializing and stuff so that's just to summarize number one thing food quality whole foods number two are you hitting that protein target that we mentioned and are you getting that ideally for single ingredient foods use protein powder if you're struggling to hit that number by all means and then uh, the third thing then is obviously you can bring the fasting in there as a tool and just see how that fits into your life. Because what you're going to look at with fasting is it's that sustainability. You know, 95% of people, they say to me, oh, yeah, I'm going to start fasting. It's like yeah. I'll either say to them outright, you know, you might want to reconsider doing that because, you know, you've gone from eating. And the average person eats eight times a day, by the way, right? So. Again, a lot of people are not mindful enough to know, but when they actually uh, did a proper research on this, they found that people were just eating mindlessly all of the time. So the average person actually eats eight times a day, so with snacking and stuff like that. And then that same person, if we're talking to the average person, well, people listen to this are not average, right? They're probably they're very growth-minded. So if we just look at the average person eight times a day, and then they're going to go straight to fasting, or oh, man, everyone's talking about oh, man, right? Uh, One meal yeah. a day. It's like, no, no, yeah. no, no. You've got no place doing that. Essentially, you're using it for the wrong reasons. A lot of people use fasting to lose weight, and it's a terrible approach because then you're trying to restrict again right so that's what i would say really is again another uh, a long in-depth answer but um i, I would say that's the priority no you know? I, I i completely agree uh from the analogy of a car it's almost like fasting is tuning but if the engine needs an overhaul then you probably wouldn't tune a a knackered engine like let's mm. fix that let's fix that engine first let's get it back to its working order let's get let's get it working on all cylinders and then we can start to think about tuning it but um, so protein, uh, fat, carbohydrates, often considered the fourth macronutrient, alcohol, um, in its own right. Where does that sit with you nowadays? Because with alcohol comes, it's a little bit like in the olden days. I watched a movie called The Gremlins, and they said, you know, with with gremlin comes responsibility. Like you treat it very carefully, otherwise it's going to grow out of control, and the whole fiasco is going to start. And that was the basis of the movie of things going wrong very quickly. Um, alcohol can lead to um, overeating, of course. Um, all of the guard, you know, our guard comes down. It can. It's another way of consuming calories very quickly. Uh, it can disrupt the liver, and the liver's got a good job to do. It can also disrupt sleep, and sleep is really important if you want to hit all the health goals. Where do you sit on that? Because I would imagine you would have come from being like party boy Martin Silver all the way through to, well, I know a lot more now, and I've got longevity in mind. Um, do you still drink alcohol? If you do, how much, and what are your thoughts on it? Very occasionally, so I'm drinking less and less and less. So, for example, last year, so I'll be honest, unlike Stu, because I know Stu, you have no desire to drink. You've never enjoyed it, right? No. Um, I, I actually enjoy it. I thoroughly <laughs> enjoy having a few drinks. It makes me feel incredible. You know what I'm saying? Even my girlfriend prefers me when I have a few drinks because <laughs> I'm less, <laughs> less kind of like, you know, yeah. uh, what's it called? I'm more relaxed or whatever it yeah. is. But, no, I really drink now, so I drink less and less. Like last year, I said, right, I'm just – I'll just drink. I won't drink for like six months of the year. So last year I didn't drink at all for six months. Even when I drink now, I never drink excessively. It's very, very rare that I'll drink excessively. It's just a few drinks. But this year, for example, again, I didn't drink for the first three months of the year. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this out now. I'm gonna aim for like eight months, just eight months of no drinking. It's a weird target. Mm. It's not all at once. So I just break it up now. So this month, so this year I won't drink for eight months. And I'm just drinking less and less because I'm becoming more and more aware of the damage it does um and i know you use the aura ring to track your sleep right Stu? yes and i started using that and the last time i drank i did that jiu-jitsu comp back in april and i had a couple of drinks after that and i timed it so i'm like well i'll have a few in the daytime so it doesn't impact my sleep 
ruined my sleep, even drinking in the daytime, ruined it, right? Yeah. And I was like, okay, that's enough, cut it out again now. So I go to Bali at the end of July, and I might have a few drinks there. We'll have a few drinks in Bali, but again, I'll just be a few. I'll try and do it in the daytime. One of the biggest things, one of the biggest problems, there's so many different things here, but I would say the main things that have caused clients to come and done in the past or what will be a big hindrance for you if you're looking to improve your health, get in better shape, it's going to be the inhibition first and foremost, exactly what Stu said, is the decision making. So it's not always the alcohol itself uh, that is a problem, that is a massive problem, but it's going to be the decision making, right, that you make when you drink, right? You get sloppy, like so many people get sloppy when they drink in terms of food choices, and those behaviors which you haven't essentially fully repaired, so to speak, or haven't changed certain behaviors with food, you might have certain food you enjoy eating. For example, my girlfriend, Janini, she doesn't drink, which is great. That's another thing that really attracts me to her massively, right? <laughs> <laughs> is that she doesn't drink at all. And it's awesome because your environment is key, right? So when I'm with her, she never drinks. So it's great. So I've got, there's no temptation there for me. And I always say, for anyone listening, if you if you struggle and you drink a bit too much, you know it's always better to to, to avoid temptation than it is to resist it. Yeah. So who you spend your time with and who you're around, willpower is like a muscle, right? I think I've mentioned this before, but it's like a muscle. It's going to get fatigued and tired if you have to try and rely on it all the time. Willpower does not work as a long term approach. So changing your environment is key. So that's been a game changer for me. Just you know, not having people around me. And I, I purposely avoid, I don't really only spend time with anyone that drinks nowadays anyway. Because, and it's not that I can't, I can, I can, I've been out with people and I do this a lot. I go out and I don't drink. Um, but if I'm with certain people, I'll still get tempted or in certain environments. So that's number one. It's like changing your environment um, and it's decision making. So you're going to make poor decisions, whether that be with your food, whether that be, we all know the stuff we do on alcohol, right? Uh, but the big one is you're just going to let your guard down with food. We all know what it's like, right? Some people are different. You're either going to drink too much and just drink excessively, and then the next day you feel like crap, and the next day you're writing it off and you're eating a load of crap, uh, or at the time you're having a few drinks. And that's why my ex-girlfriend stopped drinking because she would literally – she stopped drinking a few years ago. She never really liked drink anyway, but she just used to be around friends again, going back to environment. And what she would do is she would drink, and then she would just go to like Woolworths and Coles here in Australia at like 11 o'clock at night – and just buy ice cream, just completely lose her shit, basically, right? And she was like, I've got to stop this now because it's getting way out of my hand. Um, and that's an extreme example, but it's the decision-making. Um, it's also the sleep is a big one. And it, it, it's kind of funny when people say to me, oh, no, I sleep fine. You know, people say I can have a double espresso. Or I can drink three drinks, and I sleep fine. Yeah, in fact, it helps me drink alcohol. It doesn't. You're mm -hmm. lying to yourself. It's yeah. simple. Most people are aware of the fact that it's going to wake you up. You're going to get fragmented sleep. Um, where you just wake up more often and stuff like that. But sometimes you, you, you're semi-conscious when that's happening anyway, so you're not aware of it. So the sleep is a massive one. And, and to be honest, the aura ring has really shined a light on that for me. And it's like, that's helped me a lot because I'm, I'm thinking to myself, do I really want to take this hit just for the sake of a few drinks? Yeah. No, it's not worth it. So that's the big one. Um, but then it's going to come down to, to, to you know, dehydration as well, right? So, you, you know, you're poisoning your body. We can talk about all the negative physiological effects. There's never any physiological. We talk about people talk about red wine and, you know, polyphenols. When you look at the trade-off, essentially you're poisoning your body and there's never going to be any value from it. Now, there can be a social value from it though, right? It can be socially cleansing. It can help you relax if you can do it in moderation. And if you haven't got that thing where, just like Stu was saying, where, you know, because I have alcoholism in my family as well, so I do notice if I have a few drinks or whatever, the next day I'm like, oh, I fancy a few drinks again. I'm sure people can relate. You don't have to have alcoholism in your genes to <laughs> relate to that. You have a few drinks. The next day, it might be a Sunday or a Saturday. It's sunny. People are drinking. You might go to a show, have a few more drinks. And it's that knock-on effect you get then, the potential negative impact on your sleep, decisions you're making with food, the dehydration as well, right? So that's a big one. If you can simply just drink, you know, a pint of water in between each drink, because when you look at a hangover, it's like 90% dehydration and you're also depleted of like electrolytes as well, salt and stuff like that. So the next day you're craving. Um, but just to answer that question, there are the three things that I would say to really be aware of with alcohol. And it's more a case of, you know, you've got to ask yourself as well. I don't want to go too deep on this, but you have got to ask yourself, what are you escaping? I just say to clients straight up now, you know, what are you escaping? Right, just straight up, because people deny that and they've never been asked, asked that question before. When you're drinking alcohol, and I'll say this myself, I ask myself this now. If I'm having a few if it, with Janini, for example, what am I escaping? Even even if I go to Bali, right? It's like, oh yeah, I want to relax, but do I need to drink alcohol to relax and be so? No, I don't need it. So I, I just ask myself, what am I escaping? Oh, maybe I just wanna. Uh, maybe it's boredom. Maybe it's like, you know, it could be for anyone else. It could, it could be, you know, loneliness. It could be anything at all. You're good on the list. Stress, anxiety. You've had an anxious day at work. I'll have a glass of wine. 
that can become a, a pattern then every day you have that cue i get home from work i'm looking for that stress release and most people do drink in the week as well and then you, you, you drink alcohol to calm you down so um the key thing that i just want to finish this with is is to replace the feeling right so I always say this to clients is number one, figure out what you're escaping, right? Especially if it's excessive drinking, what are you escaping? Oh, to be honest, man, I'm escaping work. My work is stressing me out so much that it just it helps me escape and just switch off from work. And that's one thing that I, you know, that is something I picked up on is why am I escaping? And it's not switching off from work. That's something I'm sure you can relate to this to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> it's very hard to switch your mind off. Yeah. Um, but it's like yeah. I don't need I don't I don't need it, but it does every now and then. It'll just help me just switch off and relax more when I'm around Janini. But I don't need it. It doesn't make any difference in terms of how I communicate with her or anything like that. It's just a thing I have in my mind, essentially. And that's the same for anything else. Ask yourself what you're escaping and then um, just look at how can you replace that feeling you get from it. So you might come home from work, have a glass of wine, it's a habit. You know, it helps you de-stress from work. What can you do to replace that feeling? Can you just distract yourself, listen to a good podcast, go for a walk? You're going you're gonna to feel more relaxed when you do that instantly. Or can you do some yoga? Can you do a little bit of exercise? Uh, can you do a hobby that you enjoy? So you, you, you're releasing your stress, but you're doing it in a way which is going to serve your health better. So it is a case of replacing the feeling you get from alcohol as well. So, awesome. yeah. No, very, very good. I, I, li yeah, I like what you're saying. And it, it's, it's really important to note that when you have the ability to track some of these metrics as well you mentioned the aura ring and sleep when you've when you can see those metrics in black and white you can't argue like you can't argue like well, i know that i had a, you know, i've had a drink of alcohol and i looked at my deep sleep and it didn't happen that night i just hit rem sleep and light sleep um then we know that there's a compromise there's a trade-off at the end of the day do you track any other metrics? Do you recommend that there are any particular metrics that you keep an eye on um, just with general health and longevity in mind? To be honest, no. Literally, the only thing I track right now is is the aura. Mm. And I was tempted to use one of those um, – I'm not sure if you use one of those blood glucose monitors um, uh, that you can – yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I have used one. one. Have you used one yet? I have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was it, was it interesting or did you learn um, it? Yeah, it was. Look, what I learned was that um, oftentimes we're told that, look, you know, don't eat white bread, um, don't eat white rice, you know, be careful of potatoes because they're at the top of the glycemic index scale and they really push your blood sugar through the roof. But very, it's very rare that any of us will have a slice of white bread in, in isolation. You know, I'm hungry, I'm going to have a lovely slice of white bread. No, it doesn't happen. Like, if you put butter on that bread, then you've got fat. That changes the score. Um, that changes how things work. Um, and it changes our taste as well, then. That's, the, that's what we're looking for, that combination of carbs and fat. Exactly like, oh. right. That's the bliss point. <laughs> yeah. um, I um, like whole foods for the win, like protein and fat, they're like, it blunts everything. Um, I found that what I was eating, which essentially was an animal-based whole food diet, was, was pretty good. Um, I found that walking after each meal was really good for glucose. Um, and that really just, it, I think it just clarified as to, as to exactly where, or what I was thinking that, uh, what I was thinking was the right approach to take for me personally was the right approach. Like it, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Sorry, continue, mate. Sorry. Um, that, that was kind of it. Like, yes, um, great. I could understand that if you were going to, um, if I was going to do things perhaps from a standpoint of I need to listen to the powers that be and in the morning I'm going to have my um, you know healthy bowl of cereal and glass of orange juice, I would have got a very different response from the glucose monitor. 100%. Yeah, that was what I was thinking of using. But just in terms of metrics, just on an intuitive level, because the only thing I track in terms of data now really is my oil ring. Obviously, I have tracked food in, in, in the past. I mm. probably did that for about six years using my fitness power with all my bodybuilding stuff and everything else. But obviously, I don't do that anymore. And yeah, just what you mentioned then about going for a walk after eating, this is a habit that I've cemented in. I've been doing this for about three years now, mm. and there's research to show even a two-minute walk can really balance and regulate your blood sugar levels. Just going for an even two minutes, they found in research, yes. and helps you obviously then feel more satiated as well because of you know gravity, I guess, blood flow to the stomach and everything else as well. So that's such a – when we talk about metrics, it's not something I track, but that's something I've – that is just a non-negotiable for me because I feel so – I have big meals as well. But I, it just is a non-negotiable because I just it helps me with energy, yep. productivity, going for a walk after my meals, 
and you know movement is medicine anyway right so that's a really really um and, a game changer for me you know i think from a blood sugar perspective there's science to show that the glucose in your bloodstream gets utilized in the muscles if you go for a walk after after a meal uh, and it imp- it impacts your um insulin levels which was which was kind of good i'm i'm into my um i wasn't into my activity monitor on the aura ring um but i'm into it now like i just keep tabs on that but basically daily step count. Last year, I experimented. I did 365 days of 20,000 steps each day. And I just thought, I want to see what happens. Just Let's just keep that to, to a, a day. And, you know, I've got a job, uh, no, a, a dog, so it's easy. You know, I can walk the dog on the beach and, 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 and do whatever I want to do. But that was fascinating in terms of what that did for heart rate variability, deep sleep, body composition, overall energy, all of the above. I've dialed oh, the deep sleep as well. You know, it's doing more movement. So you said twenty k a day, twenty thousand steps a day for I, a year. Yeah, I did twenty. I did twenty thousand a day for three hundred sixty five days, um, and it was profound. Like sleep, it, if I didn't get ninety five percent on aura ring each and every night, there's a problem. Um, wow! And so that was the game changer. I've dialed that back now, and I ch- typically do between ten and fifteen thousand a day. Twenty twenty is a little bit too excessive. Um, mm. It is excessive in the hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 it's heavy. It was a personal experiment, but definitely that daily movement, just that, just just walking, and walking is so underrated. People are really mm. transfixed on what exercise is the best. Should I swing kettlebells? Should it be you know cardio versus here CrossFit F forty five, whatever it may be? You can just walk around the block. It's so beneficial. Hundred so percent, and when, when you start attaching, you just start noticing, and that's the thing. That's the only way I get sustainable results with clients. Just getting them to pay attention to how they feel as well. Mm. It's like when you go for a walk. You, if let's say you're stressed, something yeah. really bad happens, something's going on, you're overwhelmed. You never feel worse after a walk. No. When do you ever, when do you ever go for a walk and go? I feel worse. Well, <laughs> exactly right. Happen. And, and I, I, <laughs> I tell you what I did as well when I was doing the, on that twenty thousand step. I made a conscious effort to not listen to anything. So there was no, I didn't have my earphones in, there was no podcast, no music, there's no, I just, I wanted, I thought, well, what is it, what is it like if I can hit that step count and just use that time to think? And it was like, it was like a rebirth. It's like, oh my God, like you can, you can think about all of the issues that you might have, you can work through them, you can come to solutions uh, without this constant chatter, because social media in all of its forms and the smartphones, etc., they're continually interrupting thought. And um, and it was just it was a bliss point. It was like I'd go for a walk, and I would just think about stuff. And life seemed to get easier because I'd figured stuff out, and I'd I'd run through scenarios uh, about any potential problems or or opportunities that I was facing. And I kind of knew how to attack these. So it's kind of mm. yeah, just interesting. Hundred percent. It's a great, it's a great form of mindfulness, right? Just not mm. being distracted. Headphones, just thinking clearly. Yeah. It really, really helps with your with your thought process. And also, just for anyone listening back as well, it's like what you said. A lot of people they say, you know, I train, I train every day. I'm really consistent. But then when you look at like how much movement they're doing, mm. they're hardly moving at all. So That's your right. total calorie output, fifteen percent of your total calories burned. So you've got you know sixty seventy percent is just your body burning calories to mm. keep you alive. You know your basal metabolic rate. But then you've got fifteen percent. Right of that, uh, if the total calories burn. So in other words, your waking hours, the most calories you're going to burn is from non-exercise activity, thermogenesis, or NEAT is what you call it, which is essentially just your movement day to day. Mm. And going for walks is great, but even if it's just moving regular, so you do if you're doing stuff around the house, just making sure whatever you do, you hit a certain amount of steps. It's just going to have a, a night and day difference on on fat loss as well. You're burning thousands more calories over the space of a week. Yes. You know, it's significant. So yeah, no, simple thing which is overlooked. Yeah, and it's uh, and we can well. It's at our disposal. Like we can mm. do it if we want. Like everybody's got fifteen minutes to wander around the block, um, and it's so, so great for digestion and mindset and sleep, particularly. Yeah, all of the above. Yeah, um, changing your state, as you said as well, right? Just a great way to change your state, right? Yeah. When you're when you're in any any state, you, like for you, for example, you might have had a few problems you have to solve. Mm. Change your state, change your environment, game changer. Especially if it's out in nature as well, right? Hundred well, uh, percent. That's right. And and I, I mean, up in Byron Bay, I'm very very lucky. We've got these long, endless stretches of, of beach. So it would just be shirt off, board shorts, get in the sunshine, just taking it all in, being immersed, grounded, vitamin D, all of the above. Unbelievable. Yeah. Beautiful. So, beautiful. So good. Perfect. So, mate, we're kind of coming up on time. Just a, uh, a closing question that I would like to ask you. Um, 
health and wellness space right now, what excites you in this space? So what excites me in this space right now, I would say it's more like a bit nerdy really, but the the research and everything coming out on like neuroscience, I know it's not technically health and fitness, mm -hmm. but it relates into that and all the research coming out on the human brain. And it's something I've always been fascinated about is just psychology and the human brain and how that relates to fitness and the stuff we were talking about as well in terms of just how technology is advancing now, you know, with the continuous uh, blood glucose yeah. monitor we just talked about and those kind of things. And I do think, wow, with everything, you know, how everything's ex accelerating so fast now with AI and everything else, it's really, it's really interesting now in terms of like devices and tools that we're able to bring into play to track things. And yeah, so the nerdy things, I guess, is definitely neuroscience and, and, and brain and all the behavioral stuff really, really fascinates me, but also it's the stuff on metabolism and the tools we can use to track these things because when it comes to metabolic health, metabolic health is the most important thing. Mm. It's been proven time and time again now in research when it comes to any health ailments. In other words, not carrying excess body fat, especially around the midsection and on your internal organs and stuff, um, is is key. So all that kind of stuff really, really fascinates me, really, just the, the tech and uh, the human brain and metabolism, really. A bit, bit of a nerdy answer, yeah. but that's what comes to mind, Stu. <laughs> no, it's good. No doubt you would have probably listened to uh, no end of, of Huberman then on the podcast. I mean, he is definitely the king of kind of neurobiology and all that stuff. Andrew Huberman? Yes. Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. man, 100%. He's the one that got me, like, tuned in even more. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what else, though. Yeah, but that's the, the main things that come to mind. Um, for me, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned metabolic health uh, and everything that we've spoken about today will impact that drastically. Moving away from ultra-processed foods and dropping the industrial seed oils, refined carbohydrates over to a, a whole food approach, moving your body, getting sunshine, working on sleep. Like, the game changes. Um, yeah, exactly. And it always comes down to those things, right, right Stu? And just to kind of wrap this up, it always it's, it's going to come back to the same fundamentals but it is a case of how you, what you can take away from these podcasts, right? You can take one thing away mm. and implement it, yep. and just don't get caught up with the shiny objects, right? Whether that be whether that be fasting or whether that be any specific diet fad or whatever it is, it is going to take you away from where you want to go a lot of the times. Yes, and and not only that, it can it can actually put you in a worse position because just like Stu said, you're not focusing on the priorities, right? Mm. So when you come down, you know, if you if you look at just drinking enough water, nutrition training, sleep, which is obviously the yeah. big rock, your environment, um, essentially, Absolutely. and they're going to be the main things, right? And movement, as we said, sorry, how can I leave movement out, movement out of there? If you, th if you think about those six things, yeah. and if there's any of those that you're lacking or you're not being consistent with, focus on one of them yeah. and essentially be consistent with it. But with my clients as well, I just wanted to say with the clients that I help, I really help people like ambitious people normally who are kind of type A personality. I do help just general population as well, mainly, but a lot of them are like kind of really, they're high achievers. Um, and I'm sure people can relate to this now where it's kind of the all or nothing mentality, right? Mm. A lot of people who come to me, they've got that all or nothing. And your biggest, it can be a strength when it comes to business and what they've exceed, uh, achieved in their life. But for anyone listening back, you can probably relate to it because I used to have this as well. That can be your biggest weakness as well. Yeah. So you've got to be, it takes more resilience and more discipline to just be consistent with one thing at a time and actually then pay attention to what we were talking about in terms of the benefit those things add to your life then. So when you're moving more, you know, what benefits are you getting from that? You're probably going to notice you're less stressed, your digestion's improving after your meals. Pay attention to those things. You know, you notice that you're thinking sharper, you're more productive. When you pay attention to the health markers on each of those uh, big rocks, that's what's the true game changer, you know? Brilliant. No, absolutely, mate. Couldn't. Couldn't uh, couldn't agree more. So for all of our listeners, mate, that want to find out more about you, um, they want to dial into perhaps some of your podcasts, um, have a look at the programs, follow your journey, where can we send them? Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram is, I guess, my main platform. So that's just at Martin Silver Fitness. Mm -hmm. Silver, obviously spelled S-I-L-V-A. And then my podcast as well. The audience will get a ton of value from my podcast. It's Optimize Your Body, it's called, Optimize Your Body, and that's on all platforms, so definitely go check that out, and don't forget to subscribe if you do as well, because then you get the updates, and yeah, also, oh, there's another one, I guess I'm on TikTok as well now for my uh -huh. series, so at, at Martin Silver Fitness, so I might right. as well plug that one, yeah. uh, and, that, and that's the main main platforms, we're just building the website, I don't actually have a website at the moment, just building a new one, yeah. Um, but yeah, everything's going to be in my Instagram bio anyway, so. Okay, mate, fantastic, well look, we will... Um... 
We'll put all of those links in the show notes, but thank you so much for the opportunity to have a chat again. It has been a pleasure as always. Mate, it was great to catch up, man. Always a pleasure to, to come on. Thanks, you man. Too, man. Thank you. Bye-bye.